of the IHR's Gardens and Landscape History Seminar. Um, I'm Christine Lalamia. Good evening and welcome all. Um, our summer term, just a tiny word about the future, our summer term begins on the 29th of April and uh, it will feature postgraduate papers in progress on a range of garden and landscape history topics. So we please check the our seminar space on the IHR um, a little bit closer to the time for details. So this evening's seminar is entitled History, Equity and Inclusion in the Garden. And our focus will be on the way in which international research institutions and botanic gardens as holders of historic collections can and must take an active role in restitution for past injustice and current inequity. We're delighted to welcome Mark Nesbitt and Sonia Danda from Q and Joanna Marshner from Historic Royal Palaces. And we'll have fuller introductions and hear more from them in a moment. But before we begin, I just wanna finish up the housekeeping, which is to say, we will not be opening the chat box until our speakers have made their individual statements and then had a chat with each other, a panel discussion, as it were. Um, after which we will take questions. And so we do ask that people put their questions in the chat box once it opens and, and try to limit it to, to questions, please. Um, these will be fielded by the conveners, either I'll pick them up or one of my co-conveners who are here tonight and then put to the speakers as per usual. Um, we'll do our best to get to all of them. Um, yeah, you know, it, it's a limited amount of time, but we will do our best. The seminar will close at 7 p.m. following the Q&A. And could we ask that everyone please turn off their videos and make sure you're muted. Okay, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Sonia Danda, who is our first speaker this evening. Um, Sonia is a policy advisor at the Royal Botanic Gardens Q, with experience in representing UK interests at international meetings on wildlife trade issues. She has an MSc in conservation science and is currently undertaking her PhD on historical and contemporary motivations of orchid consumption in the UK. Sonia works in the team responsible for coordinating Q's response to global environmental conventions that frame our scientific research and collections. Sonia is interested in how collections at Q have been ordered and classified during the 19th century to facilitate information and access to people at that time, and how we can frame our collections and widen access for those who are interested or may benefit from information in the 21st century. So I'd like to ask you, Sonia, to, to kick off tonight and start the evening. Thank you, Christine, um, and to the team, um, who are organizing these talks and for the invitation to speak. And to the audience, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, we look forward to discussing your responses and questions later. So members of this audience may be familiar with the broader context of our discussion today and may even have listened to Q's recent podcast on overcoming Botany's hidden legacy of inequality. And many will have attended the Decolonize the Garden seminar a fortnight ago. Uh, Mark and I really welcome the focus that the Decolonize the Garden Group have brought to staff diversity and careers in the horticultural sector. I'd like to introduce work taking place at Kew. So firstly, the Royal Botanic Gardens Kew is a public body and it is for everyone, yet we acknowledge the effects of Kew's history, which are pervasive among its work today in our staffing, our collections, our research agenda, our fieldwork, science and horticulture, and in the way in which we address our audiences. This has resulted in equality, diversity and inclusion work at Q, which has a big agenda. And as Q is a large organisation with 1200 staff members. So currently there are two strands of work. Um, our equality, diversity and inclusion group started work in 2018 with the focus on staffing, including students and volunteers and our audiences. 
Um, driving this work forward needs expertise, and I'm happy to share that Q is in the middle of recruiting a head of EDI. The second strand of this working group that Mark and I co-chair uh, started in August 2020 in direct response to events highlighted by the Black Lives Matter movement, which had a significant impact on Q staff. Public statements from our director, Richard Deverell, and our director of science, Alex Antonelli, led to vigorous internal discussion among staff as how to how Q could change. Um, and many staff brought um, depth of thought and experiences from life and work to the internal discussions and debates at Q. And that's really been the driving force behind our group's work. Around 20 staff from various departments uh, form the core group and many more have contributed their views and expertise. We really appreciate their work, especially, has, especially ha as the last year hasn't been easy for anyone with the disruptions of COVID. So in our working group, we have divided the work into five themes, public engagement, history and heritage, language and stories, practice of science, data, knowledge and collections. And right at the moment, we are digesting the evidence and conclusions gathered by each group and the concrete outcome will be a report to be issued this summer. So we've been inspired by great examples, um, such as the report from the Royal Historical Society. And I think that really set a precedence and like why reports are really important. You know, they set out evidence making the case for action. They set out reasoning um, and especially to avoid like rushed actions and unintended consequences. And of course, they're a tool for accountability, uh, mostly for internally within an organization, but also for external or external audiences um, to help us monitor progress. So a little bit on how we are working. Um, well, I guess firstly, it's important um, just broadly that kind of educating oneself of a variety of lived experiences of racism is crucial for everyone. Um, we've had an internal space for staff to reflect and share experiences and this work will continue. Uh, we've had staff wide talks from experts on like the history of race science, such as Angela Seni. And um, there's been lots of like reading lists shared internally as well at Q. Um, and we've been drawing on great works such as Rene um, Edo Lodge and Satnam Sangera. And these works um, really draw on the consensus views of historians and economists, which are essential in joining the dots between Q and Europe's history and structural racism and inequalities um, in our own country, as well as those of our partner countries that we work in. Um, we've also drawn a literature from um, ecology and conservation um, sector and cultural museums, uh, a little bit about seed banks and some on natural history collections on taxonomy. And we were really influenced by the paper by Miranda Lowe and Subhadra Das, Nature Read in Black and White Decol Decolonial Approaches to Interpreting Natural History Collections, which you can find online. And that has been the starting point for many people, um, that paper. So our main resource uh, for gathering information at Q has been interviews, uh, both inside Q uh, among staff, but also a circle of critical friends, uh, people outside of Q um, who have experience working with us. And our reasoning for that is to um, kind of start internally, uh, see what see like our own staff reflections and so many of our staff work overseas as well. On a non-COVID year, we have uh, like 60 field trips a year. And so having those frank discussions with our colleagues internally and our overseas colleagues um, to see what their perceptions are of Q and then to kind of verify these with a growing circle. Um, and so we've been doing that with people in the kind of wider cultural sector um, as well as the natural history sector and other botanical institutes. And that's been really crucial for kind of also helping make this project manageable um, in our experience. Um, we're also talking to national museums and research institutes across Europe, um, so not just in the UK. And we've also been speaking to some um, institutes in North America. And I would say that we're working very closely with the Royal Botanic Gardens Edinburgh. Um, They're working on a similar project as well. Um, and we're hoping that our, they have a slightly different remit, but we hope that that will also rectify any gaps or inadequacies we may find in each other's work. And so this close, co close collaboration and knowledge exchange has been a really vital process of our work. 
Um, I guess so just a little bit on the report that we're issuing um, this summer. So it also coincides with our recently launched uh, corporate manifesto. And one of our priorities in that um, manifesto has been to extend our reach. And so we are talking about audiences in the gardens, online, our, our like scientific and horticultural visitors as well. And this report would be complementing that, but also providing short term and long term actions that we can take forward. And that comes with like many other layers to it, like how, you know, what, who will be accountable for taking these actions forward? How can we maintain this momentum in the future? And these are all processes that we're currently going through. And I'm going to leave it to Mark to share more about um, areas of best practice and recommendations from our work. And I'll leave it for um, there, Christine. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sonia, for getting us out of the gate. Um, that's an enormous amount of work that you're undertaking. And I'm sure there'll be questions about um, the challenges in coordinating that and, 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 and a little bit more in how it's coming together. But, you know, it was, it was so nice to hear this, this idea of discussion and listening and collaboration. So um, we'll leave that now, but we'll come back to you. Um, Mark, um, welcome. Mark Nesbitt is Senior Research Leader and Curator of the Economic Botany Collection at the Royal Botanic Gardens Q, and he is also a visiting professor at Royal Holloway, University of London. His research applies interdisciplinary and collections-based methodologies to the understanding and protection of plant-people relationships. Mark is working with colleagues in Kew's library and at several universities to develop a broad program of humanities research at Kew. Current research topics on this theme include the history of materials and materia medica, Kew's global exchange networks for specimens and information in the 19th century, and revitalization of Kew's historic collections in collaboration with indigenous peoples in the Brazilian Amazon. So Mark, may I hand over to you now? Uh, thank you very much, Christine. Uh, and thank you very much, uh, Sonia. So as, as you mentioned, we're right now in that stage of digesting many pages of ideas and recommendations uh, from our colleagues. But given our audience tonight, I'm going to home in on the central role of history. There is a, a different version of this talk which goes through all of the recommendations. Uh, that's perhaps for another time. So Sonia talked about the importance of learning in this process, and I, I want to share a confession that I've long been aware of the oppressive nature of empire, and I've also, as creator of something called the Economic Botany Collection, uh, you know, been really aware uh, of the inextricable links of empire and trade and the impact of colonial botany on populations and environments. It's really visible today. But until this last year of reading, I simply wasn't aware of the scale of the extractive nature of empire the plausibly estimated 40 trillion pounds extracted from India by the British, for example, the close links uh, of slavery to Britain's Industrial Revolution, pointed out 75 years ago by Eric Williams, uh, or the legacy of that money that is Britain's built heritage, as so thoroughly explored uh, by Historic England, uh, by English Heritage, uh, and by the National Trust. And here I want to pay tribute to uh, Corin Fowler's work with the National Trust and their brilliant new book, Green Unpleasant Land. Um, and also thinking even beyond Q, there are still other bigger questions we should raise with our public. For example, the legacy of empire and modern environmentalism. Quite an uncomfortable but important topic. Now, this is going to be really familiar material to, to all of you listening. But I'm dwelling on it for a reason. Uh, now, decolonizing it, it's a word we've hardly mentioned in this talk. And that's because we've more and more come to think that it's a term whose use simply invites debate rather than action. But in one of its definitions, it's a useful term, I think, in directly connecting the, the presence and effects of structural racism and inequality today in the UK and overseas to Britain's colonial past. It's that element of history that most interests me. It's, it's power to explain the present 
and why is this important? I think firstly, that if the causal link between the past and the present is unclear to someone, then the reason why we're talking about history in the Botanic Garden will be unclear too. It might seem irrelevant even. And I think that the implication of that is that we need to think about conveying that bigger picture, the, the global history, uh, not only the stories of individual plants, where there's a risk that that global history can be lost. I think Joanna may well touch on this in her talk as well. Um, and secondly, this link between past and present might resolve a conundrum at Q, how to resolve a tension between Q's desire to raise public awareness of its work as a scientific powerhouse um, and its joint role as creator of a nation's botanical heritage. And that heritage aspect is sometimes felt underplayed in the, in the last decade or so, but the two are, are really intimately uh, linked and each strengthens, the uh, better understanding of each strengthens the, the other. Um, I also think that one route to increasing equity and inclusion in our current practice of science, which is a really major element of, of this current project, um, is understanding the origins of our practice of science. And it's for this reason that colleagues of uh, ours at Q, scientists, are becoming increasingly interested in Q's history, whether it's understanding how a collection of succulent plants has built up, the origins of uh, inequality in botanical infrastructure in Madagascar, uh, or following the or tracing the origin of today's prior informed consent and compliance of the Convention on Biological Diversity back to very clear traces of that kind of language in 19th century correspondence. These research projects, they're not just a pure curiosity, they inform what we do now and what we can do in the future. And history is also really important in advancing dialogue on the role of repatriation and other forms of restitution. And so, for example, it's not widely known, uh, as I found in these conversations we've been having, but Q and the Natural History Museum repatriated large numbers of herbarium specimens, for example, to Australia in the early 20th century. And that was possible, of course, because pressed plant specimens are collected in duplicate. And this is an untold story, and I think one of the quite important implications for how we regard our collections today. So I think the, the case for the centrality of history, the cues current day science is inarguable and the same is true of course in relation to public engagement and the stories that Q tells to its visitors and perhaps the more difficult questions are whose history and how can it be told. So our history working group began with a literature review of Q's history and it's a remarkably thin field, surprisingly so, with pockets of depth for Victorian Q, who heard about Jim Endersby's wonderful work on Herbarium's botanical networks, a work by Caroline Cornish, Felix Driver and myself on the Museum of Economic Botany, uh, Kate Telcher's uh, new book on the Palm House, and a handful of serious studies of commodity plants, uh, such as rubber. Almost nothing has been done on the gardens. Joanna also have a word to say about that, I think. Um, the many research questions set out in the provocative and brilliant analyses of Lucille Brockway in 1979, Richard Drayton in, in, in 2000, have hardly been followed up. The current work of our five humanities PhD students, all funded uh, through the Techni Consortium, uh, on topics such as Cinchona, collections on the Amazon, Q's Arboretum, are really fruitful but indicate just just how much more is to be done. And this positive research is really bad news if you want to be transparent about our history, which is perhaps a really important first step. Um, but it's also, of course, an opportunity to, to develop this work. Um, and I think it's worth saying that Q's library art and archive team has, has really noticeably reorientated itself over the last decade from being a service provider to actually leading this work through, through collaborations. That's what's led to these PhD studentships. And I think further evidence of the success of that strategy of Q involving itself in su supporting research in its history lies in the botany 
Chinese Trade and Empire meeting held earlier this month um, online for about another five days on YouTube if you want to catch up with it. And I think many of us are becoming increasingly convinced that embedding the humanities at Kew, you know, perhaps in the form of an Institute for the Humanities, is the most effective way to increase the volume, the quality and the diversity of historical research and debate at Kew. Our history team had really clear recommendations. I think won't be a surprise to you. We must urgently study hidden or excluded histories, for example, slavery, not only in the time of banks, that would be suggested banks, would be most familiar to us, but later in the 19th century in Africa and the Americas. Uh, the role of indentured labor, until recently, I think, often overlooked. The role of indigenous experts, and here there's again a connection with today. We've been reflecting on whether authorship uh, rules in scientific journals always encourage or enable scientists to adequately acknowledge the contribution of field researchers. Still a live issue. And the agency of colonial subjects. And this often, I think, means looking at archives outside Q as well as at Q. Um, we also think a high priority is the 20th century, which is, of course, when you see decolonizing in its original sense, countries becoming independent, fundamental shifts and cues the relations of overseas partners, almost entirely unstudied, apart from Katia Neve's fascinating analysis of Q's 2014 financial crisis in her book, Post-Normal Conservation, so I warmly recommend. Now, there's a question that keeps coming up in my mind. Every time you look into Q's archives, which are enormous, astonishingly rich, Q really kept everything. You'll find a complex, nuanced story, just as you find in life today, mixed motives, blurrings between personal advantage, institution advantage, and humanitarian service, and so on. And yet, so often when we talk to a public audience, uh, history resolves to the actions of individual Western men, whose actions are in turn painted with broad brushes. They were heroes, or they were thieves. Uh, in fact, of course, they were often both. Um, but more importantly, we need to challenge the view that historic, or indeed contemporary science, is the work of, of hero individuals. How can we capture and present that nuance in our public engagement? And that brings us to a language and storytelling group. And they point out that language is the public face of decolonizing at Q. It's the primary measure by which audiences will view Q's progress. And the solutions that they propose are really similar to those proposed by the history group, but we need more diverse voices those who research and interpret Q's history, uh, whether that's through Q's rapidly growing community program, part of a major commitment to, to really seriously widening access to the gardens, and through collaboration of groups such as Black Cultural Archives, with whom we worked on part of the recent conference, uh, collaborations uh, with institutions such as Historic Royal Palaces and National Trust, with whom we actually share properties, um, or collaboration with overseas researchers, such as we're already doing of the Botanical Survey of India for the Wallet Correspondence, or new work that I'm bringing, uh, beginning with medical researchers in Bangalore on Kew's East India Company medicinal plants. Now, much of this story about public engagement is about resources, and even the agenda above of, of widening collaboration simply can't be run by existing staff. Uh, it involves, for example, uh, payment or other forms of reciprocity for community groups, uh, for historians, uh, for other expert advisors. Resources are also crucial to new forms of storytelling. Uh, for example, signage might not be the only route for conveying these complex nuanced stories. And I think Alice Proctor's book, that The Whole Picture, just out of paperback, makes a really compelling case for contemporary art as another tool, if done well, uh, and a really powerful medium. So I'm going to end here, I could carry on for a lot longer by reminding you of what you all already know. There's no checkbox list, check, checkbox list for decolonizing. There's no handbook even for decolonizing. It's a complex, difficult, experimental process of dialogue that doesn't work without commitment from senior managers and from staff, students and volunteers. Um, and we haven't talked much about cultural change, but that, that's a really central and fundamental uh, element of the process. Thank you very much. Back to you, Christine. 
Thank you, Mark. Um, it's just fascinating to hear all that's being thought about and, and the detail, and that completely underscores the amount of work that's been done, but how much there is to do. So I'll, I'll, move, I'll, I'll, move, I'll move us over to Joanne, and then we'll come back to some of the points that um, Mark, you and Sonia have raised already. Um, Joanna, are you there? Joanna Marshner is Senior Curator at Historic Royal Palaces, She's an art historian and a historian and has led many exhibition and publication projects at the State Department's Kensington Palace, where she is usually based. Um, and as part of HRP's research team, she's also worked on collaborative research initiatives, including, and these are her partners or have been her partners, Universities of Warwick, uh, Oxford, Exeter and Yale and with museums and heritage organizations such as the Royal Collection Trust, the National Portrait Gallery, and the Royal Museums in Greenwich. So it, buried there, you can see an enormous amount of dialogue and, and collaboration going on. Um, her research is interdisciplinary as it must be. And I think Mark underscored that quite clearly. And material, um, that she deals with is culturally grounded, taking in the history of art and architecture, social, economic, and women's histories. Joanne is particularly interested in exploring the intersection between the humanities and science. So Joanna, may I hand over to you now? Right, thank you very much, Christine. And thank you to um, Mark and to Sonia for setting this um, discussion up so beautifully. I want to do just two things um, this evening. The first is to introduce Historic Royal Palaces, HRP, and, to, um, and then to introduce a project um, on which, in fact, we're working really importantly with the Royal Botanic Gardens Q and um, uh, um, Mark, um, Sonia, and our, the, um, all the colleagues at our shoulders there. Um, Historic Royal Palaces is an independent charity responsible for the preservation, the management and the presentation of six royal palaces. And these are the Tower of London, Hampton Court Palace, Kensington Palace, the Banqueting House at Whitehall, Hillsborough Castle in Northern Ireland, Kew Palace and the other royal buildings surviving in what is the Royal Botanic Gardens. We receive no funding from the Crown or the state, relying on income from visitors and from fundraising. Um, before the pandemic broke over um, all of our heads, we could expect about 5 million visitors a year. Um, current debates over the history of racism and empire highlights that it is urgent and morally imperative to address the consequences of the global impact of empire in key British heritage institutions, as we have all been acknowledging um, this evening and um, last week um, in the seminar. As we look for honest and inclusive ways of interpreting the gardens and managed landscape, um, um, crucial to British identity and seek for them an improved and more ecologically aware management, we believe that it's important that heritage organisations return to the specimen, the artefact and archive um, to ask new questions, diversify the voices and to reintroduce previously neglected, discarded and lost information bases, which will allow us to overturn and refocus traditional narratives of empire and thereby broaden um, um, their communities and their audiences now. The Royal Gardens and landscapes, particularly those at Hampton Court, Kensington Palace and at Kew, became increasingly accessible um, to, a, to um, the public from the 17th century onwards and were steadily adopted as public spaces, becoming eventually the well-loved and much visited uh, green oases within 
um, urban landscapes and widely recognized as aesthetic symbols of British identity today. Yet there is little understanding that they were entrepôt of empire in the appropriating, marshalling, managing and exploiting of plant productions, just as surely as the palaces themselves were imperial entrepôts for craftsmen skill and artistry, materials and treasures. Their agenda embraced not only delight in the ornamental novelty of new species, but also the economic benefits that could be derived from these. The rural gardens were conceived as spaces in which the politics of dynasty, nation and empire could be powerfully manifest and experienced um, by a wider community. Both historically and today, they sit at the heart of a global as well as a national network of gardens and landscapes. Historic Royal Palaces is now committed to a re-evaluation of the complex entangled histories um, of their gardens. And to initiate this conversation has put together a proposal for a three year research project, which is provisionally called the Imperial Garden, Palaces, Plants and Politics. We are joined in this venture by Mark and his colleagues at Kew. Professor Erica Charters and Professor Stephen Harris from the faculties of history and plant sciences respectively at the University of Oxford and Dr John McAleer, a maritime historian at the University of Southampton. We're going to be submitting a grant application to the Arts and Humanities Research Council in the next few weeks so that this work can be funded. The project addresses the question of how the richly documented rural gardens and landscapes can be understood and reinterpreted, reinterpreted within the context of their creation as part of Britain's imperial ambition between 1660 and 1861. This may be a period before the bureaucracy and mechanics of empire is professionalized, this is most evident from the 19th century onwards, but British ambition with respect to the exploitation of the natural world in earlier centuries was still far reaching and aggressive. While scholarship, as Mark pointed out, has been conducted on the imperial context of, gar of botany and gardens, there are histories of individual plant collectors, for instance, as Mark mentioned, about botanical gardens around the world, about specific commodities, um, primary source information to allow a more detailed nuanced study is still um, very much lacking. And cultural and scientific institutions struggle to, protect, to portray the complicated, interconnected, dynamic and incoherent nature of empire to audiences. Um, 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 visiting gardens now. We propose as part of the, this project to digitize part of the archive relating to the Royal Gardens and to make these publicly available for the first time. We believe that the information generated has the potential to create a new framework in which the discussion of the garden is cited and it will address fundamental questions facing public gardens of all kinds about how they should discuss and display um, the way in which the mobile nature of botany serve both the aggressive and productive nature of British Empire and engage the wider public in a sensitive discussion of their decolonization. There'll be two research strands that we will explore the first is about the mobilization of the natural world, which whether through long distance trade or communication networks was at the heart of the British Empire. The project aims to disrupt the perceived stability of the archives of plants living at the Royal Botanic Gardens and in other Royal Gardens or dried as captured in queues and the University of Oxford's herbaria to reveal the global movement of plant species and to integrate the journeys of associated indigenous knowledge into Western scientific, artistic, economic and historical frameworks. 
the inward books, the accession registers of plant introductions to Q in this early period, which we will digitize, will often mention not only the name of the plant collector and the site at which the plant was gathered, but the ship that brought the materials to London. State agencies such as the Royal Navy, as well as commercial maritime business manage this mobilization. And we will seek to map journeys, that the journeys made in more detail by allying information held in the Caird Library at the National Maritime Museum and in the archives at Lloyd's Register Foundation, where both the mechanics of the imperial appropriation and the encounters with indigenous habitats and their local stewards are captured in diaries, letters, logbooks, and in insurance records. The second ambition is to map the scientific and cultural on processing and domesticating of plant materials gathered as part of British imperial ambition. Their transportation, classification, use and display, both in Great Britain, its nations and regions, and as recirculated around its colonies. As disinterest and cultural and political ambition led to the discarding of frameworks of knowledge which traveled with the plants from their indigenous habitats and communities, reordering and cataloging plants, as well as growing, cultivation, displaying and experimenting with plants through greenhouses and other practical technologies, saw non-British plants undergoing a process of physical, scientific and cultural reconfiguration into forms of British knowledge and imperial prowess. Our proposed digitization of information about plants from the Royal Garden captured in the Herbarium collection at the University of Oxford from the mid 17th century onwards and the outward registers at Kew, which logged plant disseminations to the Academy and Learned Societies to elite horticultural and nurseryman networks will allow a more forensic um, appraisal of how gardens and landscapes um, comprised of international plants were gradually but steadily categorised as British. These are both research questions which must be explored with a wide scholarly community, not just based in the UK, but also in countries around the world in which Britain formerly had interest and from which plant materials were taken. We must ask ourselves how we can reattach plant history severed and lost as the natural world was mobilized for political gain. We must explore how we can find again the silent voices, the unmapped interactions, the invisible journeys that our gardens contain that can only be retrieved by mapping how they have shaped later understanding. We'll be working with an international community so that we can engage the research knowledge, the communities and the experience which can lead to the revisioning of the garden as a rich and complex, complicated and beautiful global construction. Time and finance limits for this project mean that our network necessarily has to be limited, but we're proposing working with Singapore Botanical Gardens and Singapore University Durban Botanic Garden and the University of KwaZulu-Natal, the National Trust of St Helena and Bartram's Garden in Philadelphia in the USA. These partners will unite with HRP and Q, English Heritage, the Eden Project, the Horniman Museum and Gardens and the Gardens Trust, we, we hope, to formulate, experiment, test and evaluate new ways of discussing, managing and interpreting the the garden based in the new research materials the project will provide. The Imperial Garden project, if we can bring it about, will never be the answer to all the, uh, to, to the important challenge with the, which we must address, but we trust it can be a useful start. Thank you very much, Joanna. Um, again, just, just adding that to Sonia and Mark's comments, my mind is reeling with the time it all takes to do this well, the resources needed, um, human and financial, <laughs> the buy-in and, and the collaboration and time zones. And it's, it's amazing, um, but it sounds like it's, it's been 
it's being conceived as a project that is hugely comprehensive and very impressive and I can't wait until more of it comes out. Um, I know that we, we want to have a discussion between the three of you. Uh, would, would, would anyone like to kick off? Have you, have you got something you're burning to say, Mark, Sonia? <laughs> Well, I, I'm happy to kick off. Um, so I know, uh, Joanna, that you've been, uh, I think, quite impressed by the the, the, the long-standing links that both Kew and Oxford have maintained with their other herbaria and botanic gardens around the world, but often for hundreds of years, part partnerships uh, changing you know, in format through time. Now, I was just thinking about historic royal palaces. Um, so there are very intimate links between somewhere like Kensington Palace and the various palaces in sort of Central Europe, which you know, some of Queen Victoria's children such as Prince Alfred, dispersed to, uh, uh, and you know, the nature of the British royal family, there are extensive links throughout the 18th and 19th century to palaces on the continent of Europe. Do, 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 do you curators have sort of friendly, continuing links to those palaces? And are the kinds of conversations that we're having today coming up with those palaces? Um, yes, indeed they are. First of all, there are really, really useful academic networks. There is a, a, a organization called the Royal Residences of Europe um, network, which um, draws together the administrations of palaces throughout Europe to discuss matters of kind of sort of common concern, which of course can be research questions, but they can also be, you know, far protection, they, they are, um, um, you know, visitor management, educational policies. Um, when it comes to um, the histories of gardens and landscapes, um, indeed our work has generated some very, very interesting discussions, particularly in the Netherlands. Um, where, of course, from the 17th century, there are long connections with, um, with uh, um, through uh, dynastic connections um, with uh, between Britain and, and the Netherlands, um, and their their scholars will be um, uh, are very interested to see how the work that, that both Historic Royal Palaces and Kew are doing, which touch on imperial ambition, can be extended within their communities to look at other empires. Um, and this will, you know, the, the Netherlands almost certainly, but the um, research centre at, at Versailles looking at um, French ambition is also very interesting. And I would love to think that Spain and Russia and, um, and the research the various research institutes in Berlin um, can eventually kind of sort of join this conversation. Mm, thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to ask you a question, Mark. It's not a, it's not a, a huge question, but I, I just wanted to comment on the Institute for the Humanities that you envisage or hope for um, at Q. Could you tell us a little bit more about that and why you think it's needed? I mean, how does it tie into tonight's subject? Well, I think the, I, I have learned more and more through, you know, and this model has entirely developed through collaboration with you know, wonderful people at uh, Royal Holloway, at, at UCL, uh, perhaps now at Goldsmiths, uh, at kind of widening our view of what, what we can do at Q and how it can form uh, bridges. Um, and I, I think in a lot of what we, we often you know, term difficult conversations, but the humanities, alongside the arts, I'd say the arts and the humanities, often provide the tools, the language, the, the mm. people with the expertise to, to lead and enable those uh, conversations. So it's very directly linked to uh, you know, tonight's uh, conversation. Um, but I think what prompted me really quite a long time ago to start thinking about this was my own experience as, as a creator and you know 
having people make appointments to come and see things, coming and looking, not understanding them, uh, and then leaving. It was highly, uh, and as, as a researcher, as well as a, a creator, like I said, it's highly unsatisfactory. Uh, and we developed a model that's, that's much more collaborative, and where we spent a lot more time with visiting researchers, and that became a sort of richer and richer experience. And something I realized we needed to perhaps capture and formalize. So you know, just for example, the Botany Chadon Empire Conference was a rare example where we brought back together lots of people who have individually done research at Q over the last 30 years or so with some of course, great stories from, from Richard Drayton about life in the archives in, in the old days. Um, and that that effort and knowledge and the opportunity to strike off ideas is lost if there isn't some kind of coordination. And what I'm aware of, and very aware of, is that it's really important this is not an effort to control humanities research at Q. It's not an effort to control language or ideas. It's very much about uh, enabling and widening. And I think there are, you know, one of the aspects of humanities research it's pretty extensive now, uh, and you know, we've been successful in these collaborative projects, but it's all project-based work, and we need to be thinking about longer-term sustainability, we need to be thinking about being able to offer you know, our own fellowships so people bring their own research to queue, rather than always writing joint proposals together, then automatically somewhat narrow what you do. So I think there's a, there's a, a bright future for humanities at Kew. And uh, I'm pleased to say that many of my, my science colleagues seem to agree with that and are more and more on, on board with that mission. And not to put you on the spot, um, but how would then that get out to the public? We've touched a little bit upon, uh, upon digitizing archives and, and getting things out digitally, but how else do we get it further out? Well, I think, I mean, one very simple reason for having such an institute is, in fact, branding and the you know, retention of the, the really the most interested visitors. And I, 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 I'm ambitious. I, I, I think many people are interested in, for example, the conversation that we, we're having today, because well beyond academic researchers, and you know, like most of my colleagues who've done lots of hands-on uh, uh, work with, with members of the public, where I you know, I teach at this, or talk at the same level, slightly different language as I would with master's students. I think people are interested in complexity and, and uh, difficulty. So I think that there's one element there, but I think the other is what is the bridge between humanities research and what takes place in the gardens? And this is uh, uh, something we're really working hard on now with that language and storytelling group. Um, you know, part of it is about drawing back in people who have done historical research at, at Q, um, who are often you know, willing and enthusiastic to, to, to share their work, especially if they've just published a book. Uh, you no, know, that, that's a very mutual relationship. But that, that's not enough. That's where resources come in. That's where payment comes in, where it may mean, who knows, perhaps a post such as public historian of the kind that we've seen pop up now at many museums uh, and as an inclusive creator of historic royal palaces. So that, that bridge, I think it's really important that the model in the past has often been of people in a hurry dipping into the archives for a story about the queue. And that that really doesn't work. You, you know, hi history is, is a technical expertise. Uh, we can do a lot to train up our own staff in, in doing that. Um, and I'm a really good example of a scientist who's now at least proficient to dabble in history. Um, but we also need to have that, that bridge into professional history. I, I think that's right. Um, and, and maybe it's bridges different bridges, different different ways in. And mm -hmm. um, just, we have a question and I'll come to that in one second, but before we move on to that, um, Joanna, I, I think you said, well, you did say, um, and, I, and it really made me think so much, I knew, but you know, when you have to hear something again and again and again, which is the way in which plants become divorced from their history, obviously, but, even about the sort of the facts about them and, and that going back, as you said, to returning to the object, the artifact, the plant is absolutely central. So it's almost an empirical 
um, uh, exercise as well as reassessing the history. And um, that seems to me very exciting. I think that's going to be both very exciting and also very important. Um, we've already identified a few, um, a few tiny uh, hints that there is information that can be reattached to plants as these plant journeys are reconstructed. Um, we found in the late 17th century um, um, herbaria, uh, um, plants pressed within the herbarium at Oxford, tiny pieces of paper which said this was originally called this. And it will be wonderful if that tiny little snippet, which now of course has a massive scientific classification sort of hanging on its tail, um, can be reinstituted um, within that hierarchy. Um, we are allowing to, um, to botanic gardens and research projects elsewhere, which are also looking at the work of those plant hunters who made, the, who, who um, articulated those confrontations both with indigenous habitats and the communities um, who um, were the stewards there. And it's very interesting to see that particularly in America, the work which is happening around um, John and William Bartram, where the records of um, plant collecting, which so often um, are received here then as dried specimens, as beautiful illustrations of extraordinarily exotic looking um, new introductions, um, actually do have a history which will talk about the negotiation that brought those, um, that, that sets the, those plants on their way. And if we can draw these things together, I think this will be a wonderful thing. Um, as part of our project, we're hoping that we can take just a few species right from those first, those, those habitats through as many conversations, um, as many hands as we can find um, right into our gardens today so that we have got some case studies of just how rich, how complicated um, and how fascinating and extraordinary um, all of our gardens are. It, it's, it's, it's going to be almost, a, yeah, it, it's, it's almost endless when you start thinking about the unraveling, how, how far this will go and how exciting it is. Um, Joanna and Mark and Sonia, there are quite a few questions. Shall I, shall I start with them now? Unless you have, yeah. Um, okay, so um, someone is asking, uh, Isabel says, the recent story in The Guardian about Richard Deverell, the director of Q, quote, hitting back at claims that publicly funded, that the publicly funded institution is going, grow, it says growing woke, but I, I think it might be going woke, saying it could no longer stay silent on Britain's colonial exploitative history and modern day race issue. And then the question that follows that, that's the end of the quote is, is anti-racism going to be a part of how Q tackles this issue? And has this work been started internally? I wonder, Sonia, if, if you were referring to this in part in your introduction. Yes, um, thank you for this question. I would, yes, as I was mentioning earlier, this work really, this is the kind of work that really needs expertise. And this is why we are bringing on a head of EDI. Um, and of course, they, as one person, cannot do this in isolation. They'll be working in collaboration across, you know, with all the senior management across Q and all the grassroots support groups we also have in the organization. Um, we have we have had um, some discussions on this so far. I guess we've had training on like, you know, unacceptable behavior, um, active bystander training and training like this will kind of roll out continuously with for staff you know because it we do need an internal culture change but it can't all just happen through training it has to happen 
through other mechanisms as well. And we know that there are, you know, this is like work that needs to be done by professionals, you know, who can bring in expertise such as nudge theory. Um, and we do have a big drive for this in our corporate manifesto. So it's absolutely one of our priorities as well. So not just internally within our staff and volunteers, but also with the audiences and the visitors that we're engaging with. And we do have programs underway on how to kind of extend our um, vis our gates basically to more underrepresented groups that we have and then we currently have in the gardens. Um, but yeah, so it, it is starting um, and it, it will continue, but it, we are um, hoping that with the head of EDI that this work will really be driving forward. One of you, I can't remember which, Mark or Sonia made a comment, you know, slightly um, self deprecating comment about strategies, you know, and, and corporate plans and that kind of thing, how it's easy to go, oh no, not another strategy, but actually how very important strategies are in institutions, because once it's in the strategy and it's written down and it's been adopted and agreed, it's there and it's much more important than often in day-to-day -day life we realize. Um, so I just wonder if you could just say a very quick word about how the work you're doing is really feeding into future strategies. Yes, yeah, so as I mentioned, we recently launched the Corporate Manifesto, um, and that is organization wide and it includes um, a party on extending our reach, but then at the same time in the summer we're also launching the scientific strategy. Um, and this will this also has some of the kind of scientific um, kind of recommendations that we have that Mark sort of alluded to in terms of how we look at authorship and um, our practice of science and research. Um, and then we're we're also uh, producing the report in the summer, the, like, the report that Mark and I are working towards um, on short-term and long-term recommendations. But that is really there for a tool of accountability so that the organization can then um, take that to the executive board and division out like who will be the work plan owner for that work. Um, so they do, they all link together, but like we do realize that this work needs to be tackled. And that's why it's really important to have like this separate report um, alongside our existing strategies. And there are numerous other strategies that queue. We have a people and culture strategy, um, which is where the EDI work comes from as well. Um, there is a question that I'm paraphrasing, but it, ha it, it, it's, it relates, I think, to how, how then these strategies in these corporate manifestos perhaps go outward and sort of and reach, let's say, politicians, um, policy makers, lawmakers. I mean, do, do these, does this concerted effort that you three have talked to us about, and it's obviously widespread in botanic gardens and various cultural institutions, um, can, this, can this reach further and further into really the, the structure of, of, of laws and the society and, you know, get right out there, right? Is this gonna get attention at that level? Fair enough. Do you want to say something on this or not? I'm not trying to be provocative. I'm just hoping that this this will ripple out. I'm sure it will ripple out. Um, all of us have um, boards of trustees, which include, um, you know, many important voices within from many worlds, um, and all of the initiatives that we have been talking about have been um, rehearsed and backed. Um, by these organisations, so I'm sure they will. And I mean, I'll just perhaps add to that, but I, I'm, I'm optimistic about the effects of this work. I think there's a lot of organisations doing it and, and that mutual support is, is really important. I, I, I wonder if there's not a change in mood. I think the reaction to, to Richard Deverell's most recent statement seems to have been largely uh, positive. And I think what, what we're delivering, which is more equity, more inclusion and more history, 
you know, who who doesn't want those things? That, that's but those are not controversial things. And I think you know, furthermore, the you know, government said it once Britain be a scientific powerhouse. Uh, we we do better science if we do this work and if we wrap humanities, equity, and inclusion into our work, it, it's it's all part of the same package. Mm. Um, I have a question about um, botanic gardens. Um, someone has asked um, about the conversation that is very clear between Western botanical gardens. And you highlighted this, Mark, Joanna, you highlighted this very clearly. Um, the, the question is, um, is there a plan of establishing a conversation with gardens and historians across the countries directly impacted by Western colonization? Now, I actually think you've, you've touched on this, but maybe a quick repast. I mean, maybe I'll just say from our end, but it's important to say we've been having two kinds of conversation. One is, if you like, with gardens and botanists in the, for want of a better term, the global self, about what changes we should make. And another is with botanic gardens in the global north, about how we as botanical institutions can make the right kind of changes, uh, because we are the institutions that need to change. We would like, and, and this is a, I know, a strong view of Alex Antonelli, our head of science, to move on uh, to much wider global discussions on this topic. But we've always been clear that we need to work out what's happening at Kew and how Kew needs to change first, together with our close partners at Edinburgh and elsewhere, before we start the very ambitious global networks. But Joanna, it's been really uh, I've loved the way you brought the diverse international gardens into our joint project. Could, could you say more about that? Yes, necessarily. Um, we, have, um, we have only been able to, to um, approach a limited number of gardens. We have been, we have, we have um, the ones that we have approached, we have been uh, um, concerned, um, have um, scholarly communities and student bodies um, working in association with them, with a view that we have lively, um, diverse communities with which we can make some real um, uh, conversation. We're also really aware that this can only be a start. We have chosen for, for the Imperial Garden Project, um, we hope to have a research community in Singapore, which historically is linked very closely with um, the, um, the gardens in India. We have got Durban, um, one of the earliest foundations in um, Africa, St Helena, and a garden in um, North America to represent the beginnings of a global conversation. We've also drawn in project advisors, and this again has included people then from the Caribbean, people with expertise in the botanical um, botanic gardens in India and Pakistan, for instance, just to try and broaden that spread. It can only be a start, but it's a, it, hopefully this is a conversation that will um, encourage many others. And the programs, the impacts that we hope this project will make will be cast in the nature of experiments, of tests, of conversations to ensure that there is continuing legacy um, for, for people to follow up um, on, um, you know, we hope on a much broader global basis. And, and on various levels, I imagine. Yeah, and on various levels, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we have a question here, which I'll just throw out to you, which is essentially, um, this, the, the questioner asks, I think it's important to ask the question, why the silence from these large national institutions until now? Is, has there been total silence? I mean, I know, that, I know actually having come from museums that 
there's been a lot of work for a long time and perhaps museums and cultural organizations are not good at talking about them to the public or disseminating um, information, but ha has there been total silence? And is this what you're addressing now? Well, I'll, I'll say something to, to break the silence. I, I think I've often reflected on this. Sonia and I have had many discussions you know, about how, how to, to, to widen the audience for this work. Uh, I've been very aware that, that this is, you know, it is it's difficult. It's new, difficult work. Um, and I think that we, and perhaps all other institutions have found that we needed some time and some space to, to get this right, to have the diversity of, of and depth of, of conversations. Uh, and you know, now we're, we're at the stage of, of shaping an interim report. We, we have, a I think, a much clearer sense in our minds of where this work is going. And it's a lot easier to, to talk about that now. And, and the process is, is very clear as well. But that period from you know, June until now, I, I know because of the conversations we've been having with other organizations, a huge amount of work has been going on. It's quite difficult to do that work and to run a public conversation about that work at the same time. And, and sometimes you need, and sometimes you need to state the obvious, a period of reflection. And with so many voices, you, you have to listen and, and, and think. So thank you for, for tackling that. Um, there's one more question that I think might, might be something you'd also like to comment on, Mark, which is just someone flagging, of course, that we mustn't forget um, the economic benefits to Britain of you know, trading plants, acquiring plants, taking plants, bringing plants. So um, I know this is right up your street. This will be part of your work and, and what comes out of, 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 all of all of these studies and projects, isn't it? A closer look at that. Yeah, I mean, this is perhaps really, really Sonia's area because I, mean, I think there is a difference between current practice, which is Sonia's expertise, uh, you know, benefit sharing and, and prior informed consent, and the past. I, I think, you know, perhaps what's being raised here is the question of restitution. Yeah, I, I think those many countries that benefited from their empires you know, have, have a responsibility to help repair the damage. I think you know, as a botanic garden, there are particular targeted ways that we can do that. And indeed have, of course, been doing that, but I would love the scale of that work to increase the support that we give to for infrastructure, botanical infrastructure, mm -hmm. for example, in other countries. Uh, now, I think that, that <laughs> The, the process of the extraction over the last four centuries is a dominant narrative of colonization, and it is one that needs to be addressed. Mm, mm. So I'm sorry, I should have included you in that with Mark, but of course you're included. Do you have anything you want to add? If it's talking about kind of modern day um, plant extraction, I mean, so Q mostly focuses on non-commercial on non-commercial research um but regardless if it's commercial or non-commercial commercial research um a lot of plant collecting use and acquisition is sort of governed by the convention on biological diversity and the nagoya protocol um on fair and equitable access and benefit sharing and so at q we do have a structure in place um with our partners we have agreements and material transfer agreements. So we have the legal framework behind, behind this kind of plant use, but our main focus is non-commercial use. Um, I mean, I would be happy to discuss further, but I'm not sure on what aspect exactly. Um, but there are lots of articles on biopiracy, um, but I, I think we don't, we focus on non-commercial use at Q. Um, I suppose one of the important things is it, it is it is out, in, in, in the conversation now. Um, I think it's, 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 it's past seven o'clock, it's nine minutes past. Um, Mark, I wonder if there's any final thought you'd like to leave us with and Sonia and Joanna, I'll ask you as well. <laughs> Don't feel any pressure. 
<laughs> I, I think I will just have a go, perhaps, answering a, a really inter another question from Isabel, the legacy of colonialism, how does it manifest itself at the queue today? And you know, I think that that's a, an important but hard question to answer because it manifests itself in all aspects of British society uh, and work. I, I think, you know, we haven't talked much about our current science, but it's, it's worth perhaps sharing our impression, you know, Q, you know, uh, as decolonizing that original sense of, of countries getting independent has progressed, you know, Q has changed enormously in its practice over the last you know, 70 years or so. And yet what we find is in inconsistencies uh, arise. And, and that that's one of the key areas we'd be uh, looking to target, you know, perhaps through a code of practice, perhaps through an ethics board, uh, and so on. So I think the legacies of colonialism are there, and it's up to us to be alert to them uh, and, and you know, think of ways of tackling them. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for picking up on that, Mark. Sonia? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'd say that, you know, so we're working uh, at Q and we're doing what we can internally and with the audiences that we engage with. But of course, as Marcus and many others have been saying, that a lot of these issues are society wide. Um, and but we can work on these as well. You know, for example, we know that in for like STEM careers, there is, you know, kind of a, a lack of having a, in particular people of color and women in, the, in those pathways. So of course that would also impact in the future like recruitment into our institute um, in terms of how many applicants we can have from this background and so that would require long-term work and you know engaging with skills we do we do have skills programs but it's about how can we kind of make this program wider and how can we have more impact in, in that way um, and contribute to society in in that kind of frame um, so i guess starting as an institute what we can do is use our current platform and and you know, collaborate and continue to have these discussions, but, you know, it's not really for one institute to solve on their own or one individual. It really needs to be a team effort that is, is helping. Um, but yes, we would welcome all the support and help from anyone <laughs> who would like to um, help us with this. I think um, collaboration was a key um, sort of, not theme, but a point made over and over. Uh, in our last seminar, and it seems again to be the thing. You know, no one institution can tackle this. It's it's talking, it's collaboration, and as, as people have pointed out, and you, you all have said, it's not just within Britain. It's moving out of Britain and back to Britain. So it's 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 going across the globe. Um, Joanna, any any quick final thoughts? Well, my comment was going to be a call to arms too. Um, and particularly with respect to um, the Imperial Garden Research Project that I um, talked about in particular, um, if we get the funding for this, um, it would be, we will be looking for um, lively, um, thoughtful fora um, in which to debate the new data that the project will, um, um, will reveal. Um, one of the rather extraordinary um, impacts um, of this, of the beastly pandemic, has been that we have found ways like this where it has been possible to convene an international audience um, to, um, for discussion. And it would be wonderful to know that we can come back perhaps to um, you and all the colleagues in due course. Mm -hmm. and to ask questions of you, to present you with the information we're finding and to encourage um, a wide debate um, about how this um, um, refocuses the discussion of the garden into the future. Absolutely, that's such a perfect sort of call to arms at the end. And I think our cohort here at the IHR who's interested in Garden and landscape history would be very pleased to be involved again in part of a, cons uh, you know, a, a consultation or a discussion or a dialogue, um, or even just be sort of a, a, a reflecting pad, as it were, of, of ideas back and 
forth. So thank you very much for, for thinking of that. And we will, we will certainly pick that up in, in the future. Um, it, 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 it really only remains for me to thank you three, of course. It has been absolutely fascinating and there's so much food for thought and, and so much reading to do that even just tonight that you've thrown out and recommended. Um, it, it's fantastically rich what you've given us and I'm really grateful. And um, as are my fellow conveners and everyone who is here tonight, but also just to wish you luck in, in these huge, big, complex, important projects. Thank you and, and fare thee well. So good night, everyone. That's the end of term and uh, enjoy the spring. <laughs>